trust is a fragile commodity, arduous to earn and even more so to restore. Once trust is broken, the pattern tends to repeat, betrayal becomes a recurring theme. Regrettably, my spouse chose to disregard my trust, breaching it irreparably. Forgiveness seems out of reach in such circumstances. Sometimes, the wisest choice is to release individuals from our lives, as clinging onto them can invite further turmoil. Approaching the table quietly, I met my wife's gaze, which shifted from surprise to dismay. Her shockingly unattractive expression mirrored my internal turmoil. Though Douglas made a move to rise, I motioned for him to remain seated, cautioning, Stay where you are, Douglas. While you're seated, we can avoid unnecessary confrontation. Avoiding a public spectacle, I addressed Julia with a composed demeanor. I regret disrupting your private moment, Julia, but feigning illness to evade spending time with me and consort with someone of his ilk is beyond disappointing. You know well my disdain for Douglas. Yet, to choose this place, our sanctuary, where cherished memories were made, adds another layer of betrayal. This place once held profound significance, but now, like you, it has lost its allure. On our wedding day, you made two promises, I will never do anything to hurt you, and I will never do anything to make you stop loving me. As I see it, those are two broken promises. Firstly, I'm deeply hurt, and secondly, my love for you is fading like an ice cube in hot coffee. You understand me better than anyone, Julia. You know my process. I see the situation, analyze it, identify the problem, and look for a solution. I see the situation, you're here with Douglas. Upon analyzing it, I conclude that you want to date other men. As your husband, I won't permit that, so clearly, I'm the problem. My solution is to remove myself from the equation. You're now free to date whomever you wish. I hope this decision is worth it, Julia. As I turned to leave, I added, Douglas, this isn't the end for us. I'll be seeing you around. I hurriedly made my way to the exit and onto the street, crossing Michigan Avenue and turning the corner toward the lobby of the Drake Hotel. I concealed myself as I observed Julia rushing out of the door and onto the sidewalk outside Spia. Frantically, she scanned the area, searching for me but failed to spot me. Disheartened, she eventually crossed the street, hailed a taxi, and headed north towards our condo a few blocks away. Though deeply upset, I found some solace in knowing that I disrupted her evening with Douglas and that she cared enough to leave him and return home in hopes of finding me there. She wouldn't. After waiting a few more minutes to see what Douglas would do, I observed him hailing a taxi and departing in the opposite direction. Deciding to remain at the Drake for a few days while I sorted out my life, I entered and managed to secure a room. You're probably curious about how we arrived at this moment, so let me fill you in. I'm John Burton, and my wife's name is Julia. After graduating from MIT, I landed a job as a software engineer at Grace System Solutions, a software developer based in Chicago. My boss, Greg Grace, was the owner of the company, and I must say he was a pretty good boss. I quickly climbed the ranks and found success in my role. At the second company Christmas party, Greg introduced me to Julia, his goddaughter. She was the daughter of his best friend, whom he had invited to the party. I suspect he had orchestrated the introduction with the intention of setting us up, and I'm glad he did. Ever experienced love at first sight? Well, that's what happened to me. Julia captivated me from the moment I laid eyes on her. She was not only stunningly beautiful but also witty, funny, and everything I could have hoped for in a partner. I was completely smitten. We hit it off immediately and never looked back. As mentioned earlier, the party took place at Spia, and it soon became our special spot. Three months later, during a Saturday evening date at Spia, I asked her to marry me. Without hesitation, she jumped into my arms and said yes. We tied the knot, and with each passing day, our lives improved. Both of our careers thrived and we often celebrated with dinners at our home. We exchanged vows in 2010, and for a while, everything felt perfect. However, about six months ago, I began to sense that the honeymoon phase was fading. I understand that it can't last forever, but I hoped it would. 
while I was pretty sure there was no infidelity, there's always that lingering doubt. It was just a sense that the spark in our romance had waned. I took action and began organizing a surprise trip for us. My close friend and former roommate, Adam Hartley, who worked with his father, Ben, in the software industry, happened to be a client of Greg's company. Since I often traveled to their offices in Cleveland, I coordinated our plans with one of my scheduled trips. The plan was for Julia and me to join Adam, Ben, and their wives, Carolyn and Gloria, for dinner in Cleveland on Friday night. We had a brief business meeting scheduled for Saturday morning before heading to Niagara Falls for a couple of days alone, returning to Chicago on Monday night. My intention was to rekindle our connection, however, Julia seemed hesitant about the trip, unaware of the Niagara Falls surprise. I had to persuade her to agree to join me despite her reluctance. On Friday morning, I woke up to find Julia absent from our bed. After searching, I discovered her asleep in the spare bedroom. I gently asked, Julia, are you awake? She stirred and replied softly, John, I fell ill during the night and quietly moved to the spare bed so as not to disturb you. I'm feeling really unwell and just need more rest. Could you please call my office and inform them that I'm sick and won't be coming in today? I followed her request and left her to rest while I headed off to work. Around 10 o'clock, I phoned a check on her well-being, and she informed me she was still feeling unwell. I remarked, well, I suppose I'll have to proceed to Cleveland on my own then. With no response, I ended the call and promptly dialed Adam to inform him of the change in plans and to discuss any alterations. Adam proposed that, given Julia's condition, we might consider cancelling the Cleveland trip altogether. Instead, both couples could rendezvous in Chicago on Friday night, with Saturday dedicated to shopping along the Magnificent Mile. If Julia recovered by then, we could convene for dinner on Saturday evening. I found the suggestion brilliant and assured him that I'd arrange reservations for them at the Drake Hotel, meeting them at Spiagia across the street for dinner at 6 p.m. I proceeded to cancel my flight, the Cleveland Hotel booking, and all the arrangements made for transportation and accommodation in Niagara Falls. It was disappointing, but sometimes that's just how plans unfold. At 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I phoned Julia to check on her well-being and to see if she might be up for joining us for dinner. However, I encountered a busy signal and, in the midst of preparing my presentation for Adam and Ben, regrettably forgot to try calling again. Eventually, at 5.30 p.m., as I hurried out, I attempted to reach her once more, only to get voicemail. Leaving a message detailing our plans, I hailed a taxi to Spiagia to rendezvous with the group. While enjoying cocktails at our table before our meal, Adam suddenly wore a troubled expression and delivered unsettling news. John, I hate to break it to you, but something distressing has occurred. Julia just entered the restaurant accompanied by another gentleman. They're situated behind you and to your left near the wall. I'm truly sorry, John. Turning slowly in my chair to confirm, I beheld Julia with another individual. I hesitate to call him a man as he was none other than Douglas Dog Simon. I despise him and always will. To cut a long story short, he left my sister Barbara at the altar. Two days later, he appeared at her door to confess he didn't want to marry her. Three weeks later, we saw his marriage announcement to another woman in the paper, followed by a birth announcement five months later. Barbara was devastated, and though I believe she's better off without him, she's never fully recovered. That's why I refer to him as dog and harbor such hatred toward him. Returning to the present, I was utterly stunned, unable to articulate more than a few stuttered words. The sympathetic expressions on everyone's faces were evident. Eventually, I managed to say, well, isn't that something? Clearly, I cannot continue this evening with you. I refuse to ignore what we've all witnessed. I propose that you four carry on with your evening and let's reconvene for breakfast tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. in the hotel coffee shop. By then, I trust I'll be in a better state. Furthermore, it's evident that Julia and I won't be joining you for dinner tomorrow night. I deeply apologize. Please forgive me. I embraced the women and both men, as they were old friends, before making my way to the table where my wife was seated. 
I was fairly certain Adam trailed a few steps behind, ensuring everything was okay despite knowing it wouldn't be. I appreciated his concern. Returning to their table, I found myself back in the midst of the confrontation. Now I'm in my room at the Drake, having switched off my cell phone earlier. I decided to turn it back on. There were numerous messages from Julia, but like others in my position, I simply deleted them unheard. After deleting the final voicemail, my phone rang again, but I ignored it, letting it go to voicemail. I had no desire to hear anything she had to say, promptly deleting the message and switching off my phone once more. On Saturday morning, I met Adam and Ben to discuss our business relationship. I expressed, guys, I anticipate significant changes in my life. Before signing the new contract from Greg, I'd appreciate if you could hold off. I need time to navigate my marriage and job situation. You're aware of Greg's connection to Julia's family, which might impact our arrangement. There might be better options for you down the line. However, if not, I understand. Perhaps you could continue on a month-to-month -month basis with Greg until my future is clearer. What are your thoughts? In unison, they responded, John. We will honor your request. Our allegiance to Greg is because of you, and if your circumstances shift, we will stand by you. Just inform us of any necessary steps and updates. We're here to support you in any capacity you need. I felt tears welling up in my eyes as I hugged the two of them tightly. Then the ladies headed into the restaurant, signaling it was time to usher their husbands off to spend their money. Adam's wife, Carolyn, grinned and joked, Come on, darling, your credit card needs some action. I think I'll warm it up for you. Gloria, Ben's wife, chimed in, I hope Ben's cards can handle the heat because we're going to swipe them so much today they might just melt. It's not often we get a chance to shop the Magnificent Mile. Despite my emotions, I couldn't help but chuckle. I knew they were teasing their husbands and trying to lift my spirits. I appreciated it immensely. After exchanging hugs, they departed. I briefly considered heading to the office to sort things out but thought better of it. Greg might be there on a Saturday, and Julia might expect me to show up. Instead, I decided to stay away and tackle my tasks early Sunday morning. The rest of Saturday afternoon was spent lost in a book I had picked up. The following day, I headed to the office and organized a few things. I devised a plan for what I intended to achieve on Monday morning. Afterward, I returned to my hotel room with the Chicago Tribune and perused the apartment advertisements, aware that staying at the Drake wasn't a long-term option. I knew I needed an alternative. Once I had identified a few possibilities, I made some calls and scheduled appointments for Tuesday morning. With everything arranged, I relaxed and decided to watch some football. On Monday morning, I visited my attorney. Roger had been my attorney since my arrival in Chicago, so I asked him if he would encounter any issues representing me in a divorce case. He responded, Absolutely not, John. I find it hard to believe you're divorcing Julia. Your love for her is unlike anything I've ever seen. I responded, Roger, the crucial term here is love. It's in the past tense now because I no longer love her. If you'd rather not represent me, that's fine but I request that you also refrain from representing Julia. He agreed, saying, I'd prefer not to represent either of you, John. I believe you should attempt to resolve this, but if you can or won't, then you should engage Jacob Easterman. I trust he'll handle your case well. Please try to resolve it, all right? I expressed gratitude for the referral but insisted, there's no chance of reconciliation, Roger. I simply don't love her anymore. I met with Jacob, who assured me he could have all the necessary paperwork ready to file by the end of the day on Tuesday, and Julia would be served Wednesday morning. The next task on my agenda was a trip to the bank, where I obtained a cashier's check for half of our savings account. I opted to keep all the funds in our checking account, as there would be ongoing bills to settle until our divorce was finalized. Julia and I had a specific financial agreement in place. We each contributed a fixed amount monthly to cover operational expenses, along with designated sums for dining, entertainment, and a fund for household items and equipment. 
This fund had accumulated significantly due to our habit of consistently contributing more than we spent, hence I left it untouched to cover expenses until the divorce was settled. Additionally, we both allocated around $500 per month into a savings account for vacations and holidays, of which I withdrew my share of 50%. The entirety of our individual earnings belonged to us to invest and utilize as we pleased. Both my investment account and her investment account were entirely separate, managed by different brokers. I'm unaware of the value of her account, and I suspect she's unaware of mine. Similarly, we each managed our 401k plans independently. The only financial information we shared was the monthly deposit into our checking and savings accounts. Afterwards, I went to a different local bank and opened new accounts for myself. I deposited $25,000 into my checking account and $125,000 into my new savings account. I attended to a few other financial matters, such as insurance, before deciding it was time to address things at the office. Upon arriving, I was promptly informed by Kelly, the receptionist, that Greg wanted to see me in his office right away. I thought to myself, here we go. As I knocked on his door, he beckoned me inside, saying, come in. John, and closed the door. I just got a call from Julia. What's going on? After recounting the entire story, he inquired, What's your plan now? To which I responded, I'm going to divorce her. What? Although I genuinely liked Greg, he could be arrogant at times, and it became evident immediately. He declared, No, John, you're not. You're going to tough it out and reconcile with your wife. You can't divorce her and still work here. Those are your options, fix things with Julia or I'll terminate you. Feigning surprise, I replied, Greg, are you suggesting that my worth to this company is contingent on my marital status? Have my contributions not been satisfactory? Have I violated any company policies? By now, you might have guessed that I had recorded the entire conversation on my phone. John, you've been a valuable asset to the company, always adhering to the rules you helped shape. However, Julia, who happens to be my goddaughter, is adamant that unless you reconcile with her I'll have to let you go. Do you understand? Despite feeling pressured, I plan to shift the dynamic. Suppressing a smile, I responded in a somber tone, Then Greg, you'll have to make it official because I'm ending things with Julia. Greg appeared surprised and disappointed as he uttered, John, you're terminated. I requested security to accompany me to my office to collect my remaining belongings. Anticipating the situation, I had already removed some items on Sunday. With my history with Greg, I knew him well. When I arrived at my office, or rather what used to be my office, there were only a few items I wanted. I packed them into a small box I found in the storage room. Just as I was about to leave, Greg stopped me. John, what about this picture? It was a photo of Julia and me on our wedding day. She looked stunning in her gown, and I have to admit I didn't look too bad in my tuxedo either. A wave of sadness washed over me, and I felt tears welling up in my eyes. I replied, ah, yes, I always liked that frame. I picked up the picture, removed the back, dropped it into the trash bin, and placed the frame in my box of belongings. As I turned to leave, Julia was standing there. She looked shocked, tears streaming down her face. Clearly, she had seen me discard the wedding picture and understood its significance. In a subdued voice, she asked, Johnny, can we talk? I paused my departure just momentarily to respond, Julia, there's no need for discussion. You've already betrayed me, or were about to. You've broken both vows we made on our wedding day. You've hurt me deeply, shattered my heart, and done something that extinguished my love for you. As the saying goes, you can't mend a broken heart. What's left? Do you honestly believe I can overlook your infidelity? You know how much I despise Douglas for what he did to Barb, yet you chose to cheat on me with him. Can you truly expect us to salvage our marriage? No, Julia, there's nothing more to say. With that, I continued out the door of my workplace and out of Julia's life. I phoned Adam Hartley to inform him about Julia and my decision to divorce as well as my termination from Grey System Solutions. 
I explained that I was developing an advanced system security program surpassing Gray's current offerings, but it required a couple of months for preparation. I inquired once more, would you consider remaining with Gray on a month-to-month -month basis until I'm ready to introduce my new program? For the past two years, Greg hasn't allowed me to program as part of my job. Instead, he has assigned me system maintenance projects and handled all customer service and relations issues. As a result, I've been writing code in my free time, and it's nearly complete. If I hadn't been fired, my plan was to offer it to Greg after he had the chance to see the improvements over his current program. However, now that I'm no longer employed here, I'll have the freedom to market it on my own. Adam responded, I would need to consult with my father before giving a final answer, but I'm fairly certain we would be open to giving you a few months to finalize it. After evaluating it, we could then consider implementing it here, of course. In just four days, I managed to transition from the hotel to a lovely apartment. Despite the steep monthly rent, I had enough savings to sustain myself for a few months. Following the move, I dedicated 10 to 12 hours daily to coding and testing. While confident about its readiness for the market, I was compelled to complete it and move forward with my life. During this period, Julia received divorce papers and reached out to discuss it, desperate. Listening to her voicemails, I found no pressing need to engage in conversation. She expressed, Johnny, I'll admit I might have considered being with Douglas if you hadn't intervened, but I never acted on it. I realize my mistake and still love you. Can we please talk? Johnny, I love you and don't want a divorce. Please call me, she pleaded. Johnny, can't you find it in your heart to forgive me and give our marriage another chance, she implored. Johnny, I miss you, she exclaimed. I grew tired of the situation, so I reached out to Jacob and requested him to contact Julia's lawyer, informing them that I would pursue a restraining order if her behavior persisted. Shortly after, I received a message from Julia, Johnny. I adore you and wish to reconcile with all my heart. It pains me to hear that you're considering a restraining order, but if that's what you feel you need to do, I understand. This will be my final communication to you. I cherish you more than anything, but the decision is now yours. I regret causing you so much pain that you won't even speak to me. I love you dearly. Feel free to call me anytime. True to her promise, I received no further voicemails or texts. However, the outcome wasn't what I had anticipated. It marked a somber conclusion to our marriage. Even though we hadn't finalized our divorce, it left me feeling profoundly saddened. Over the span of three weeks, I dedicated many hours each day to working on my programs. On a Friday afternoon, not long after lunch, Jacob called me to inform me that we had a court hearing scheduled for the following Wednesday morning with Judge A. Jan Caldwell. He conveyed that this wasn't good news, as Judge Caldwell had a reputation for being strongly opposed to divorce, often subjecting individuals to extensive scrutiny before granting it, if she granted it at all. Upon our arrival at the courtroom, Julia and her attorney were already present, and our case was promptly called. As we took our seats, the bailiff called for order, prompting us to rise. Judge Caldwell entered, greeted us, and then turned to me, posing the question, as the petitioner in this divorce case, I'm inquiring whether you would consider dropping this action and instead return home to work on your marriage. I responded, No, Your Honor, I wish to proceed with the lawsuit. I sensed trouble brewing when she displayed disapproval but acquiesced with, Very well then. Addressing Julia, she queried, Mrs. Burton, do you consent to this divorce proceeding, or would you prefer to attempt reconciliation? Without hesitation, Julia asserted, Your Honor, I adamantly oppose divorce. I cherish my husband and am wholly committed to salvaging our marriage. Mr. Burton, having thoroughly examined the petition, noting the grounds of irreconcilable differences, and observing your remarkably equitable proposed settlement, I find no sign of the typical acrimony seen in most petitioners. Can you account for this? Your Honor, I bear no animosity towards her, nor do I seek to inflict harm. My intention is simply to end the marriage because my love for her has faded. Julia gasped at my words, her response tinged with a hint of sorrow. The judge proceeded, stating, 
I believe there's a strong possibility for resolving your issues given the right opportunity. I'm mandating marriage counseling with a highly qualified therapist. You'll have three joint sessions initially, followed by three individual sessions for each of you, and then two more joint sessions. The only exception is if the counselor informs the court that there's no hope for salvaging the marriage. This is my ruling. With a decisive strike of her gavel, she called, next case. I wanted to object, but Jacob held my arm and advised, John, attend the first session and see if you reconsider. If not, clearly express to the counselor your desire to end things and see where it leads. The counseling session was a disaster. Julia wept, apologized, and pleaded for me to halt the divorce and work on our marriage. Though the counselor listened to me, he didn't appear very sympathetic to my wish to end the marriage. He inquired, John, can you explain why you're unwilling to consider working on your marriage? Dr. Graham, let me share a story. Not fictional, but it might sound like a fairy tale to some. I was at my company's Christmas party and spotted a woman across the room. Ever heard of love at first sight? That's what it was for me. My boss introduced me to his goddaughter, Julia, and I knew she was the one I wanted to spend the rest of my life with. I glanced over at Julia and saw a smile, a departure from the sadness and tears just moments ago. She seemed perfect for me, and apparently, I was perfect for her too because not long after, we became deeply involved. Three months later, I proposed and from then on, we didn't look back. I believed we were flawless. This time a small sigh escaped me, almost a sob but not quite. I continued, it was love at first sight, Mr. Graham. It wasn't a gradual growth, it happened instantly. Love at first sight. Do you think that reveals anything about my psychological makeup? I believe it does. If love can happen at first sight, then falling out of love in an instant wouldn't be too far-fetched, would it? Julia was out with another man. She insists nothing happened between them, and I'm inclined to believe her, but the fact remains she was on a date with someone else. In any interpretation, that's infidelity. And to make matters worse, it was Douglas Dog Simon, my archenemy. It wasn't just any man. Julia knew how much I despised Douglas knew the whole story of how he hurt my sister Barbara, yet she chose him to betray our marriage. Adding further insult to injury, she accompanied him to the most significant place in our relationship, the place where we first met, where I proposed, where we shared countless happy moments, and where I envisioned celebrating milestones like her first pregnancy and the birth of our first child. When I witnessed her sitting with Douglas, his hand caressing her face, their glasses clinking in a toast, and the smile on her face, it felt like the love of my life was betraying me with my worst enemy. My heart shattered, and the love I once had began to seep away. By the time I reached their table, my heart was already half empty, and as I left the restaurant, it was completely devoid of love. There was nothing left for the woman who had been my everything. So, you understand now, Doc why I can't continue in this marriage. There's no love remaining, and I refuse to stay in a relationship where love has evaporated. Can it be any clearer than that? By now, Julia was openly weeping, and though I empathized with her, it didn't sway my determination. My feelings for her had waned, and I desired to end the marriage. Turning to her, I expressed, Julia, I regret causing you pain, but can't you understand where I'm coming from? Staying married when there's no love left isn't fair to either of us. Dr. Graham interjected, Our session has concluded for today, but I believe we've laid everything out on the table. I'm optimistic that with individual counseling, we can make progress and potentially mend your relationship. I'll advise the judge to continue these sessions. I was infuriated by this point. After everything I've said, there's no way I'm going to more counseling. It's delusional to think this marriage stands a chance. If you want to counsel Julia, go ahead, but I'm done. Storming out, I thought, how can anyone be so oblivious? Two days after the scheduled date, I received a letter from the court outlining three dates for my individual counseling sessions. Unfortunately, I missed the first appointment, which resulted in me being brought before the judge and ultimately found in contempt of court. Judge Caldwell imposed a $500 fine and warned that missing the next session would lead to imprisonment. 
Defiantly, I declared that I would not attend any more counseling sessions, which led to me being incarcerated as predicted subsequently. When I skipped the following session, a police officer arrived at my door two hours later to escort me to Cook County Jail. It was not a pleasant experience. Despite daily visits from my attorney urging me to reconsider, I remained steadfast in my refusal. On the third day, I received an unexpected visitor, my former boss, Greg. During his brief 15-minute visit, he expressed remorse for how he had treated me and offered a potential solution. He proposed that if I agreed to attend individual counseling, Judge Caldwell would release me from jail. Afterwards, he suggested we discuss how to resolve my situation, with the possibility of me returning to work for him. He emphasized that no promises were required, only that I consider his offer. After quite some time, I finally experienced a sense of positivity. Greg had always been a reliable friend until the fallout with Julia. I agreed to his request and promised to consider returning to work for Gray System Solutions. The judge arranged my first individual session for the following day. An officer accompanied me home, waiting while I prepared for the appointment. He then escorted me to the session and waited until it concluded. The session involved the expected psychological probing, and I made every effort to cooperate. Afterwards, Dr. Graham escorted me out and informed the officer, Mr. Burton was very cooperative and has agreed to attend the next session a week from today. The officer cautioned, Very well, Mr. Burton, you are free to go home, but let me warn you, if you miss next week's session, you'll face Judge Caldwell again. I wouldn't want to be in your shoes then, she's one tough woman when angered. So my advice is not to skip that session. I phoned Greg and scheduled a meeting at my place for the following day. We spent the entire morning discussing his proposed plan and making all necessary arrangements to achieve our goals. Then we went out for lunch. Afterwards, we reconvened to talk about my future involvement with Gray System Solutions. I expressed, Greg, I've always held you in high regard, and you've been a great friend. However, I have to prioritize my own interests. Do you recall when I received my last promotion? You instructed me to refrain from programming, citing that my role as a system maintenance manager and customer service relations manager was too vital to delve into coding. I enjoy coding, Greg, so I've been developing an advanced security program that surpasses anything currently available on the market by four generations. Believe me when I say it's groundbreaking and would completely transform the security landscape of our country. You're aware of the ongoing challenges retailers face with hacking incidents? Well, with my new program, that will become entirely impossible. I'm just a couple of months away from conducting tests on real company data, and I anticipate it will be ready for implementation within three or four months. Greg nodded. Do you have Ben and Adam lined up for testing? I grinned and replied, Greg, I could never deceive you. Yes, they've agreed to give it a shot. You know they're supporting you because of my personal connection with Adam, and frankly, if my project succeeds, they might leave your side. Greg nodded. You're probably right, but how are you planning to bypass the non-compete clause in your contract? Greg, the non-compete clause only kicks in if I resign or get terminated for cause. Neither of those scenarios applies here. You terminated me because I refused to sort out my marriage, so there's no issue with a non-compete clause. He smirked mischievously. I'm not trying to be confrontational because I want you back on the team, but I could have easily fabricated some work-related issues as a fallback plan. I chuckled at him, and he seemed visibly annoyed that I found amusement in the situation. Greg, I explained, I recorded our conversation when you terminated my employment, and I distinctly asked if any work-related issues led to my dismissal. Your response was a clear no, my termination was solely related to Julia not my performance. I have a recording of our discussion. Why did you feel the need to record our conversation, John? Greg inquired. Because, Greg, I know you well. I understand your feelings for Julia, and I was confident you would do everything possible to dissuade me from divorcing her. Fair point, Greg conceded. I pressed on. I anticipate significant profits from my new software venture, and I'm prepared to share that success with you, 
Greg, under certain conditions. I'm willing to return to full-time employment with you. My responsibilities regarding customer service relations will remain unchanged, but I won't be handling system maintenance anymore. You'll need to hire a manager for that role who will report to me due to its close alignment with the new program. Assuming you're on board with the new program, which I believe you will be thrilled about, the majority of my time, approximately 40%, will be devoted to program development. While I'll be working full-time for you and being compensated for developing my program and future ones, I will retain exclusive ownership of these programs. In exchange, I'll grant you an exclusive license to market them with a fixed royalty percentage payable to me. I realize this might seem bold, Greg, but once you see what I'm working on, you'll see the value in this arrangement. We're going to see great success, Greg. Being a savvy businessman, Greg responded, I agree to all the terms of this proposal, and our corporate attorney will be in touch to formalize the agreement. However, understand that if things don't go as expected, I reserve the right to terminate our arrangement. I'd like to negotiate a higher royalty percentage in such a scenario. My next counseling session came and went without my attendance, just as he had warned. The officer knocked on my door and escorted me to the courthouse, this time in handcuffs. He smirked. I told you so, buddy. Your luck has run out this time. As Judge Judy, I mean, Judge Caldwell, entered the courtroom, I could see two or three shades of bright red on her face, smoke billowing from her nostrils, and fire shooting from her eyes. As expected, she was furious. Well, Mr. Burton, it appears you've repeated your actions. I find you in contempt of court and sentence you to thirty days in jail, Judge Caldwell declared. Julia appeared for unknown reasons and suddenly exclaimed, No, Your Honor, please don't harm J.N. I retract my objections to his divorce request. Please grant it and spare him from further imprisonment. I think some spit flew from her mouth when Judge Caldwell replied, It's too late for that, dear. He's already serving time in jail. At that moment, I leapt to my feet and shouted, Your Honor, I request permission to approach the bench. She shot me a glare and spat out, you're not permitted to speak to me directly, that's what your attorney is for. I turned to Jacob and declared, Jacob Easterman, you're fired. Now, your honor, I'll be representing myself and request permission to approach the bench. As I approached, Julia's lawyer also stepped forward. What is it, Mr. Burton? Judge Caldwell inquired. Your honor. I'd like to propose a brief meeting in your chambers to settle this entire case. I believe that if we have this discussion, everything can be resolved to everyone's satisfaction. Very well, counselors will meet with me in my chambers in ten minutes. I hereby declare a short recess, Judge Caldwell announced. Once again, the gavel sounded bam. When we convened in her office, I expressed my wish for the meeting to be off the record. Despite her initial reluctance, I pressed on, addressing her as your honor and emphasizing the sensitive nature of the issues at hand. Eventually, after a moment of contemplation, she agreed and instructed the court recorder to leave the room. Proceed, Mr. Burton, she said. Your honor, first and foremost, I want to prevent any further harm in these proceedings. Please trust me on this. I have reason to suspect misconduct in the judicial process. I don't wish harm upon you, nor do I want to see your marriage or Julia's parents' marriage destroyed. While my feelings for Julia have changed, I still wish to spare her from any unnecessary suffering. I no longer love her, nor do I wish to remain married to her, but I also don't want her world to crumble. It seems you may have inferred that I possess evidence of your involvement with Julia's father. This situation necessitates your withdrawal from this case. The evidence is undeniable and quite explicit, I must say. While I could present it to you and the opposing counsel if required, I prefer not to. Moreover, if compelled, I would reluctantly submit it to the Judicial Review Board. Though I hope to avoid such a course of action, as I mentioned, my aim is to prevent further harm. The revelation would undoubtedly devastate Julia, and the consequences for your respective marriages are uncertain. My sole intention is to avoid causing pain. I simply seek my divorce. Glancing at Julia's attorney, I inquired, What are your thoughts on this? 
he gazed at Judge Caldwell and remarked, Your Honor, I've consistently admired your commitment to salvaging marriages that still had hope. While you've been tough in some instances, pardon my directness, I've understood your reasoning. If Mr. Burton's evidence does indeed exist, I'd be disheartened to learn of your affair and even more so that you didn't step aside from this case. Yet, like him, I wouldn't wish harm upon you. I urge you to grant him his divorce. He turned to me and said, Mr. Burton, all I ask of you is to simply sit down with Julia for a brief period and let her speak to you. You mentioned to the counselor that you were heartbroken, and I empathize with that. But please understand that Julia is also hurting. Just spare her a few minutes of your time. Your Honor, none of this needs to leave this room if you grant the divorce. Upon our return to the courtroom, she granted the divorce and approved the proposed property settlement. We each retained our investment accounts in 401, K, S, as well as 50% of our savings. It was agreed that the operating expense account would cover all bills until the divorce was finalized and beyond, remaining under Julia's care. Additionally, Julia would receive the condo and could reside there indefinitely at no cost. But if she decided to sell it, the proceeds would be split equally. The judge amended her previous decision of a 30-day jail sentence and instead imposed a $500 fine which I happily paid. I realized she needed to maintain some semblance of authority to avoid undue scrutiny on the case. True to her word, I met with Julia in a private interview room adjacent to the courtroom. Once again, she expressed her remorse and admitted she couldn't explain her actions. She promised to continue therapy until she found answers. Despite her pleas for forgiveness and declaration of love, I couldn't reciprocate. I forgive you, Julia, but I no longer love you, I said. After a hug, I left the room, leaving behind the sound of her tears echoing down the hallway. Over the following six weeks, I dedicated my efforts to developing the new security program and was on the brink of rolling it out onto Adam and Ben's system. Just a week before my scheduled trip to Cleveland, Julia reached out to me. Johnny, she began, I've made the decision to sell the condo, and I've received an offer of $560,000. However, I wanted to offer it to you first before entertaining other offers. If you're interested, you can buy it from me for $280,000, and I'll decline the other offer. What do you say? Firstly, I replied, I'm not interested in purchasing the condo. You can proceed with the sale, and my portion of the proceeds can be handled by my attorney. He'll manage any necessary paperwork and ensure the funds are deposited into my account. Secondly, why are you selling the condo? Julia explained, I'm selling it because I'm relocating. I've secured a new job and won't be staying here anymore. She then shared that she had learned about her father and the judge, acknowledging that she knew I hadn't intended for anyone to be harmed but the revelation still hurt her. She expressed a need for a fresh start. I wished her the best of luck in her new job and bid her farewell. Two weeks later, I arrived at Adam and Greg's company with my security software package ready for the testing phase and live system implementation. Adam greeted me warmly, expressing the team's excitement about the new system and eagerness to begin. John, he said, allow me to introduce you to our IT administrator, and there was Julia. I looked to Adam, puzzled. What's going on? He grinned, replying, Julia is our new IT administrator. I'm confident you're aware of her talent, and I'm sure you'll have no trouble collaborating with her to implement the new security package. I was a little surprised, but I informed him, I'll need a computer set up to work on some tasks for the rest of the day. I'll be using Julia a bit, but mostly I'll be preparing the package for installation and implementation the computer should have internet access. I managed to compose myself, and I must say the day turned out quite pleasant. I've always seen Julia as clever, intelligent, witty, beautiful, and enjoyable to be around. None of those qualities had changed. It was a pleasant day. I've always regarded Julia as not only my wife and lover but also my best friend, so we got along wonderfully throughout the day. It was evident that Julia was making every effort to stay close to me, engage with me, and, yes, subtly touch me. It was having an impact. As I mentioned, 
I've always considered Julia my best friend, and truthfully, I missed her. At 5.30 p.m., we bid farewell with a promise of seeing each other tomorrow and departed. While seated in my hotel room, I pondered deeply and resolved to take a daring step. I accessed the company's computer system by logging into my laptop. Yes, you know us programmers often include a backdoor in our systems just in case we need access afterward. I infiltrated the personnel records and obtained Julia's address. Subsequently, I visited a wine store, purchased a bottle of Julia's favorite wine, and drove to her apartment. Upon arrival, the doorman inquired about my intended visit and whether Julia was expecting me. I clarified, I'm here to see Julia Burton, and no, she isn't expecting me. He then phoned Julia's apartment but received no response. Speculating that she might be out for dinner and not yet returned, I asked if it would be permissible for me to wait. He granted permission and directed me to a small lounge area adjacent to the lobby. Before long, I spotted Julia entering with a man in tow. As they approached the elevator, he embraced her, kissed her, and gave her a friendly pat on the backside. Just then, the doorman snapped out of it, approached them, and said something to Julia while gesturing in my direction. I began to walk towards them, overhearing Julia pleading, Oh God, no, please no, no, no. Looks like I've stumbled upon your date again, Julia, I remarked. I'm sorry for intruding, but I'm certainly glad I did. Handing the man a bottle of wine, I added, wishing you both a pleasant evening. Exiting, I heard Julia rushing after me, pleading, Johnny, please don't go, please don't leave me again. But I did. I returned to my hotel and emailed Julia at her workplace. Julia, when I walked into Adam's offices, I was surprised to find you there. It didn't take me long to realize that you must have quit your job, sold the condo, moved to Cleveland, and started working for Ben and Adam just to be near me. I may come off as arrogant, but I assumed you wanted a chance to reconnect with me and possibly get back together, I added. I suppose Greg had a hand in that, telling you what I was working on and where I would be. It's not really surprising, but it doesn't sit well with me to have him meddling in my life regardless. I was genuinely happy to see you. Honestly, I've missed you. After all, we were great friends. I enjoyed our time together today, it felt really good. I didn't want it to end, so I brought over a bottle of wine to continue our conversation away from the office. I needed to pause and gather my thoughts, then I continued. Imagine my surprise when I saw you with another man. It's rather bewildering, to be honest. You went through the effort to reconnect with me, yet in the short time you've been in Cleveland, you've already formed an intimate relationship with someone else. There are only two explanations I can come up with for that behavior, either you're not truly interested in reviving our relationship, or you still entertain the idea of being with me while dating other men. Well, either way, I'm no longer part of the equation. I had been doubting my decision to divorce you, but your actions reassure me that I made the right choice. What frustrates me is knowing that I almost fell for it again, believing that you cared about me. You don't. You only care about yourself. I hope someday you find what truly fulfills you, what brings you happiness. The only thing left for me to say is don't try to pursue me in any way again. As far as you're concerned, I should cease to exist. I wish you all the best, Julia. I followed up with another email regarding the software installation. Julia, I've attached a file to this email with detailed instructions on how to activate the security software. There's a two-word password required to access both the file and the security system. I'll let you figure out what those two words are, but if you recall our last meeting at SPIAA, it should be straightforward. If you can't remember, maybe Adam can help, as he also heard them. As it turns out, the passwords were broken promises. Those two words would always grant access to the security system. I admit it was a bit petty, but whatever. Every time she accessed the system, she'd be reminded of how she neglected our marriage. I've installed the package on the server, and with the provided instructions, all you need to do is activate it and set secondary access codes and passwords for other users. Everything is detailed in the instructions. If you encounter any issues in the future, reach out to Greg 
and he'll connect you with the team I collaborated with on the program. As I'll no longer be with the company, best of luck. At times, men who have divorced due to infidelity may discover a younger, more attractive, and intellectually vibrant partner compared to their previous spouse. This new woman may exhibit a stronger passion for intimacy and assure everlasting fidelity. Julia seemed to fit this description before she strayed from her marriage. Unfortunately, I didn't encounter such a woman upon leaving Grace System Solutions. I fell into a state of depression. Although I still received substantial royalties from Greg's continued marketing of the security package licenses, the money lost its significance. I found myself in uncharted emotional territory, grappling with a severe blow to my self-esteem and confidence, a first for someone who had always been self-assured. Recognizing the need for help, I turned to therapy and sought counseling. After several sessions, as I began to regain my footing, while I continued counseling for a while longer, I felt confident that I was back on the right path. No, Dr. Graham wasn't my counselor. With the increased income, I approached my sister Barb, and we decided to relocate to a new condominium together. Barb was still recovering from the emotional scars inflicted by Douglas Dog Simon, while I was grappling with the aftermath of my own experiences with Julia. I invested in a lovely two-bedroom condo, complete with a stunning living room, dining area, and a top-notch kitchen arrangement. The spacious office area was particularly ideal for my needs. A couple of months later, I met my sister's friend. Her name was Jessica. From that moment on, Jess and I became an inseparable couple. It took us a while to really understand each other, to understand what is most important to us and what works best. We got married a few months later, and I was incredibly happy. We did not postpone the creation of our family, and at the moment, we have three wonderful children. Our daughters have inherited their mother's gentleness, while our son, the youngest, has a gentle kindness combined with resilience that does not allow his sisters to bully him. I've also developed a couple of other very successful programs that Greg effortlessly promotes. As a result, we have accumulated a considerable fortune and enjoy spending time with our children and sometimes alone with ourselves. Our adventures have taken us far, discovering many wonders. I'm trying to convince Jess to have another child, but I suspect I'm going to lose this argument. Julia, as per Greg's account, has moved on and tied the knot with someone else. Apparently, there's still some lingering interest from her side, but Greg advises her to prioritize her current life. While some might argue that Julia didn't technically betray me, I respectfully disagree. Intentions hold weight, and had she not been caught, she would have strayed, constituting betrayal in my view. Was vengeance on my mind? No. Yet, her actions snuffed out my affection. I genuinely wish her the happiness that Jess brings me. As for her paramour, the catalyst for our marital demise, he's grappling with the consequences of his reckless lifestyle, battling illness. Is it karma? Frankly, I'm indifferent. I carry on. Have I pondered why my ex-wife sought solace outside our marriage? Yes, extensively, and I've found my answer. A colleague of Julia's confided that she simply craved novelty, finding me dull. When pressed on whether she'd truly betray me, she could only avert her gaze. 